All right. So, um, so in this set of lectures, these next three, and then to some extent the fourth one after that, I'm going to be talking to you about something which is very near and dear to my heart, which is, uh, is social networks. And I'm in particular going to be interested in real social networks, the kind we humans have been making for tens of thousands of years, though I have a lot to say about online networks as well, and a variety of innovative ways, uh, sort of modern telecommunications, which has abetted the transformation of face-to-face -face networks to their virtual analog, um, allows us to do new kinds of things with networks and, and see uh, human social interactions uh, in new ways. And I think that along the way, I'd like to show you that a deeper understanding of the biological, sociological, psychological, and mathematical rules that undergird human social interactions and social network structure and function, that a deeper understanding of those rules that guide structure and function of networks gives us a better way to intervene in human populations, to change behavior for the better, to make public health interventions much, much better. It's the kind of transformation, in my judgment, that was similar to what happened in the 17th century with progressive discoveries regarding the structure and function of human bodies. As we begin to understand the structure and function of human bodies, anatomy and physiology, we become better able to develop modern medicine and intervene in human bodies with a more scientific, more rational uh, basis. So I'm going to have a sequence of talks, the next three lectures, and then the fourth lecture will be about social capital, which is related to networks, but a distinct idea. <coughs> Uh, sort of laying out a foundation of understanding about social networks and uh, how they relate to health and then experimentally what we might do in global health and in other domestic applications uh, to intervene to make the world better. But I thought I'd begin a little bit by sort of telling you where this interest began uh, for me because it's been coming on 20 years or so, not quite, 15, that I've been obsessed with this topic. And it began uh, with my experience as a hospice doctor. So when I finished my career, or when I finished my education, when I was about 33, finally, when I finished my education, uh, and I got my first job at the University of Chicago as an assistant professor of sociology and of medicine. Uh, and I was, as most of you or many of you know, I was a hospice doctor. I am still technically a hospice doctor. And I was, I was practicing medicine at the time, uh, which I don't do anymore. And, um, and my job consisted of, uh, I was sort of the medical director of uh, hospice that was responsible for caring for patients in Chicago that lived south of 35th Street. And so I would take my little black bag on Saturday afternoons and I would go out uh, on home visits. And I had a, a very schizophrenic practice. About a third of my uh, patients were primarily middle class uh, white uh, faculty at the University of Chicago who were dying. Uh, and about two thirds were primarily indigent, primarily African American, uh, patients who were also uh, dying at home. And, uh, and I would visit them. I would make home visits uh, to these patients. And I was meeting their families. And I was observing how serious illness was affecting not only the person who was dying, but also, um, also the other uh, members of their family. And in my lab at the time, I was studying a very old topic in the social sciences known as the widow effect, which of course is discussed at length in the readings for today in, uh, I forgot which chapter, of, uh, of Connected. Uh, and, as, and, and, and you know that the widowhood effect is uh, what we mean colloquially by dying of a broken heart. So is it the case, and if so, how is it the case, that when one person dies, their spouse's risk of death goes up? And we talked about that a couple of lectures ago, where we looked at some of the trajectories traversed, the illness risk, when, when your spouse dies, uh, how your risk of death uh, might go up. Um, and, I was, uh, and so here's an example of such a couple. This man is dying of a solid tumor, and, and here's his wife, and it's taken the vision from his eyes. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tumor that's affected his brain. And, um, and, uh, but I was, at the time, uh, when I was working at the University of Chicago, uh, one day I was, you know, and I was studying the widowhood effect in my lab, and I went to visit a woman who was uh, very poor, and she was uh, dying of dementia at home. And this woman was being cared for uh, by her daughter. Her husband had long uh, since died. And the daughter was exhausted from the effort of caring for her, her mother. Now, probably not too many of you have personal experience with this type of dynamic, but having a serious, chronically ill person in the household is shattering uh, for the spouse uh, and can be uh, for other uh, members. And, uh, and, the, and the wife's, the, the daughter's husband had become sick 
he felt as a result of his wife's exhaustion. And the husband's best friend, as it turned out, uh, was depressed because of his friend's uh, uh, illness. And, um, and so I, I was caring for this family. I was observing what was happening. And uh, one particular day after I had gone to visit, I, had, I was left the household, and my cell phone rang. And in those days, the cell phones were the size of, of, of bricks. I mean, they were like this big. And, uh, and the phone rang on as I was driving back to campus, and it, it was the best friend of the daughter's husband. So here was this random guy calling me who was suffering from consequences that had originally uh, arisen in the patient with dementia. And I suddenly had what were, for me, two very simple uh, but novel realizations. First, that the widowhood effect wasn't restricted to husbands and wives. Here, the index case was a, a woman and her daughter. And second, that it wasn't even restricted to couples. It wasn't restricted to dyads. That there could be, in a sense, a kind of non-biological spread of disease in this population, from the patient to her daughter, from the daughter to the husband, from the husband to the friend. And this was like a sudden realization to me. Because I realized that the dyadic interactions, the widowhood effect that I had been studying in my lab for the last five years at the time, was a special case of an older topic that I had been taught when I was getting my doctorate in sociology about social networks, which so, the study of social networks is a key part of sociology. It goes back 100 years. The history is reviewed in part in Connected. And if you're interested in more on this, you can Google. Uh, I did a nice interview on a scientific website, which I love, called Edge edge.org. It's a very cool site, and I was very privileged that they asked me to participate, and I did a little interview called Social Networks Are Like the Eye. I talk a little bit about this history. Anyway, uh, social networks have been a key part of sociology for over 100 years, about 100 years, and so I had learned all this stuff during my graduate training, but it had never occurred to me that, uh, that the widowhood effect was actually a special case, a simple special case of a much broader phenomenon of social interactions. Here applied to husbands and wives related to health, but actually it applied much more uh, generally. And I imagined that there could be a kind of non-biological spread of physical and mental illness. And so I came to see the world in what was, for me at least, a completely new way. So here's our mother-daughter pair, the two individuals. Uh, and here is now the little chain of four individuals that I just described to you, now introducing other couples of people nearby. And, uh, and all of these people and more are connected to each other via ties of marriage and friendship and family and, and work and so forth. And I realized that pairs of people and the effect that they have on each other are actually uh, but a small part of this much broader phenomenon of connection and influence within human social networks. And these networks are vast. And the formation of these networks obeys a number of very deep and interesting uh, rules, which I decided I was going to set the next 10, and now it's looking more like 20 years studying. Because I became obsessed with this topic, became obsessed with understanding how human beings come to assemble themselves into structures with this beautiful, ornate, and highly regular uh, pattern. Because to my eye, social networks are intricate things of beauty. And they are so elaborate and so complex and so ubiquitous, in fact, that you have to wonder what purpose do they serve? I mean, why, why do we do this? Why do we make networks like this? Why are we embedded in them? How do they form? How do they work? And how do they affect us? And so we're going to be spending the next three lectures, this lecture and the next two, talking about this, because in my judgment, understanding networks is a key part of 21st century social science. Now, first of all, what's the difference between a group and a network? So here's a group of people. Every dot is a person, 100 red uh, dots. Uh, and, um, and you can imagine that this group is, for example, uh, people defined by a trait. For instance, Yaleys, or scuba divers, or Republicans. Some group of people that share an attribute. Or a group of people that you can define in space. For example, those people over there waiting to get in line uh, to the movie theater, for example. That could be uh, a group of people. But, but a network is different than a group because a network, in addition to the constituent individuals, has the connections between the individuals. There's something extra. It's not just the people. It's this additional natural phenomenon, namely our relationships are a part of the natural world and can be understood and studied like using the natural and social sciences more generally. And those relationships need to be also seen it's not enough to just look upon people. You have to look upon the relationships between the people. So you have to add to these 100 dots something else, the connections between them. 
And there are two broad kinds of networks, artificial networks and natural networks. Now here's the simplest kind of artificial network you can imagine. You can take these 100 people and you can add 99 ties. You connect each person to the person on his left and the person on his right. And by adding those 99 ties, you assemble the individuals into a simple linear network, like a bucket brigade. And doing that allows these people to have a property they didn't previously have. For example, the ability to efficiently put out a fire, or the ability to empty out uh, debris from a crater after 9-11. Uh, so these people organized in this way are better able to achieve some objective than they were before when they didn't have these 99 ties among them. Or you could take the same people and the same number of ties and manipulate the topology of the network, the architecture of the network, and arrange them like this in the form of an old-fashioned telephone tree. Now this was a technology we used before you guys were born, before the internet, which is that if you wanted to inform someone of the school closing, what you would do is, is every person in the class would have two people they were supposed to call. So the principal would call this person and say, OK, the school's closed tomorrow. There's a snow day. And this person would call those two, and then they would pick up the phone and call the next two. This meant that the principal didn't have to call 100 people. Each person called a couple of people. And this network is optimized for the rapid and accurate transmission of information. It also has some fault redundance in it, because if one person in the linear network, if this person doesn't answer the phone, everyone downstream doesn't get the message. Whereas in this network, one person somewhere that doesn't get the message, you only lose the information transmission for people further down uh, in the network. So, so, um, so this, but the point here is that the same number of people and the same number of ties organized a different way gives the network different properties that it otherwise would have. Or I can take the same people and now a different number of ties Initiation right of some kind for some. Uh... Does anyone know what this is? Nobody knows what this is. Okay, so unless you're wearing a salamander, I don't want you in my class. Um, could you go intercept that uh, person with the black jacket and the short haircut that is leaving? Because that was really rude. I don't think that's funny at all, actually. So someone came to observe that this young woman did what she promised. It was obviously some indication, right? Um, so, um, see, the problem is I actually think that's pretty funny, but. Uh, <laughs> The problem is we have complete breakdown in civil order if we allow that to happen every day. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, we have more people coming in with different costumes. And I was actually known to lecture in costume too in the past. So, um, so I don't know quite what to make of it. So I can't have too permissive an attitude about it. Anyway. Uh, all right. So um, now if I had been more on my toes next year, I'll know. Maybe I should have gone down and danced with a student. That would have really humiliated me. It's like, uh, it's like when President Obama's daughter said that they were going to get tattoos. Do you guys know how he coped, how he and Michelle coped with this? Anyone know? It was brilliant. Yeah? You know what, what did they say? Yeah. So, no, he didn't just say he would get one too. So Obama said to his daughters, he said, if you get a tattoo, Michelle and I will also get tattoos and release a YouTube video of us without tattoos. <laughs> So that effectively stopped that behavior. Okay, so um, so uh, so where was I? Okay, so you could take these same uh, you could take these same hundred people, and you could add now a different number of ties. Here we have 450 ties. You could uh, group these people into 10 groups. This is like a military company divided into 10 squads of 10 men and women. Uh, in each squad, everyone knows everyone else. So 10 times 9 divided by 2. There are 45 dense connections between each squad times 10 squads. 450 connections are shown on this image. And this network, organized in this fashion, is able to elicit from these men something which previously didn't exist before in them, namely the willingness to die for each other. Right? You take these guys, men and women, 
You organize them in this fashion, and now all of a sudden, they have a property that wasn't present before. So the addition of the ties in a particular arrangement is able to create properties in a group and within individuals that wasn't necessarily present there before. But of course, real social networks differ in shape and appearance and nowadays in size. And, and here's what a real social network looks like, which we began to study in earnest in 2002. This was taken from one of our first studies, and this image helped us to understand the role of social networks in obesity. Now, as we saw earlier in the class, the prevalence of obesity has been rising dramatically in our society in the last uh, you know, 10 or 20 years. We've gone from about 20 to about 30% uh, of Americans uh, being obese just in the past decade, and fully 66% of Americans are now, um, uh, of adults, are now clinically overweight or obese. And numerous explanations, which we reviewed a few lectures ago, uh, have been advanced for this uh, epidemic, including the uh, move to sedentary lifestyles, urban design, and so forth. But we wondered, James Fowler and I, with whom I've done most of this work, my colleague James, and I wondered whether we could add an explanation to this list because it had become trendy to speak about the obesity epidemic. And it was clear that obesity was epidemic in one meaning of the word, which is that there's more of it than there used to be before. But we wondered whether we could understand obesity as being epidemic in another meaning of the word, meaning that there was an actual contagion, that something was spreading from person to person. And to the extent that obesity is a product of personal choices and voluntary behaviors, the fact that people are embedded in social networks and are influenced by the appearance and behaviors of those around them, suggested to us that weight gain in one individual might influence weight gain in others to whom they are connected. Now, we needed special data to study this. Uh, and so here, uh, and so what we did, I won't go into discussed in the book, we went to the Framingham Heart Study, and we looked, used some archival records, which had not previously been used for research purposes. We were able to map uh, uh, 12,000 people in a network. Here's a core group of 2,200 people from the Framingham Heart Study in the year 2000. Every dot's a person. Every line between them represents some kind of social relationship between the people, who's whose friend, or who's whose spouse, or who's whose sibling, for example. And here we make the dot size proportional to people's body mass index. So bigger dots are bigger people. And in addition, if the BMI is above 30, we also color the dots yellow. And so if you look at this image, you can probably see clusters of yellow and red dots, as if they're little outbreaks of obesity, little clusters of people who are evincing, who are evincing this trait uh, in a coordinated fashion. But the complexity is still very high, visually speaking. And in any case, several questions are raised by this clustering. First of all, how much clustering is there? Is there more clustering than simply due to chance? Second, how big are the clusters? What's the kind of radius of the clusters? And third, and most interesting, what might be a cause of the clusters? Now, one way of discerning the extent of clustering within the network is the following technique, which is actually borrowed from statistical physics and involves what is known as a topological permutation test. So what you can do is, is now imagine that, for example, the body mass index is distributed randomly in the network. And imagine this little cartoon of a network. The yellow dots are the obese individuals. The red dots are not obese. And 40%, let's say, of the population is obese. You can pick an obese individual, and you go to one degree of separation from them. And let's say there are five people in that shell of the onion. If 40%, if there's no relationship between that person's obesity and the obesity of their friends, the expected prevalence of obesity in that shell of the onion would be 40%. Or two of the five dots would be yellow in this shell of the onion. And then you could go one degree further removed at two degrees of separation, and let's say there are 15 people there. In expectation, if obesity was smoothly distributed through the graph, 6 of 15, or 40%, would be obese. Or you could go to three degrees of separation, and let's say there are 25 people there. In expectation, 10 of the 25 people would be obese. And this is what would you would observe if obesity was uniformly sprinkled and distributed throughout the social network without reference to social structure. If, on the other hand, there was a relationship between your body size and the body size of the people to whom you were connected, you would see something different. You would see the clustered BMI network. So for example, if you picked an, an index obese individual and you went out one degree of separation, perhaps three of five or 60% of them would be obese. And at two degrees of separation, seven to 15 or perhaps 50% of them would be obese. And when you got out to three degrees of separation, eight of 25 or, or uh, 30, um, 32 percent of them would be obese. So it would be like you had these peaks and valleys within the social fabric 
of an obese individual and then falling down as you move through this hyperdimensional surface, the social fabric, the social network, which is an n-dimensional object as you moved around. So as you went to one degree of separation, it'd be different than a second and a third and so forth. And then you can take this insight and do some mathematics and manipulate this idea and develop sampling uh, parameters and then begin to do the, uh, get the results on what I'm going to show you in the next slide, which is this. So here on the y-axis, we look at the increase in the probability that a person is obese given that a social contact of theirs is obese. And on the x-axis, the degrees of separation. If there was no relationship between your body size and your friend's body size, there would be 0% excess risk across the board. Right? Just like I summarized in the previous slide. But that's not what we find. What we find is, is that if your friends are obese, you've got a 40 some odd percent higher likelihood, a 45 percent higher likelihood of being obese yourself. And if your friend's friends at two degrees of separation are obese, you've got a 25 percent higher likelihood. And if your friend's friend's friends are obese, you've got a 10 percent higher likelihood. It's only when I get to your friend's 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 friends at four degrees of separation that there's no longer a relationship between that person's body size and your body size. So if I knew nothing else about you than the body size of this individual, who's almost certainly a stranger to you, your friend's friend's friend, for instance, I would be better than chance able to predict your body size. So this kind of analysis confirms two things. First, that there's more clustering than due to chance. And second, that these clusters go to three degrees of separation. But it doesn't tell us what might cause the clustering. And there are at least three possible explanations for what might cause such social clustering. And as we'll see, this applies not just to obesity, but to so many phenotypes, so many phenomena in the social world. One idea is a kind of social domino effect, or social contagion, or induction. Here the idea is that as I gain weight, it makes Sam gain weight. And as Sam gain weight, it makes Sarah gain weight. And there's a kind of spreading process in the network. The second idea is that it's not that my weight gain causes Sam's weight gain, but rather that Sam and I form a relationship because we have similar body size to begin with. That we, we, it's the love of life, that birds of a feather flock together, or homophily, which means love of life. Okay? So Sam and I have a similar body size or a similar taste in biking, and that's why we have the same uh, body size. We form the relationship because of that trait. And the third possibility is that it's not that my weight gain causes his gain, nor that he and I form a relationship because we have a similar body size, but rather that we're jointly exposed to something else, like a gym that makes us both lose weight, or a fast food joint that makes us both gain weight at the same time. And all three of these are typically present in any social phenomena. Why did you buy an iPad? Did you buy an iPad because your friends buy an iPad? Did you, technophilic person, preferentially form attachments to other technophilic people? Or was Apple's um, a marketing campaign very effective and got both of you to buy iPads at the same time? Uh, and so forth and so on. Why, why are you abusing drugs? Are you abusing drugs because your roommates are abusing drugs? Did you and your roommates form uh, this blocking group because you were both drug users? Or is there a local <coughs> drug user that's a drug pusher that's making both of you want to use drugs at the same time? So all, made all sorts of different phenomena can be understood by these three processes, all of which are typically present in any kind of social process. And the challenge is to use observational, or eventually I'll show you, experimental techniques to try to disarticulate the extent to which each of these is present. And we've used a variety of strategies to, uh, to sort this out. For example, let's consider the idea of a college dorm room. Uh, so um, so this is, these are real photographs of the students from two different perspectives of a real uh, college student dorm room. I'll, I'll leave the gender of the students to, to your surmise. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and the question is, you know, did one roommate's lack of tidiness affect the other roommate's uh, tidiness? Uh, did they decide to become roommates because they were both very untidy individuals? Or was there some other exogenous event that was causing both of them to act in this ridiculous fashion, such as the very small dorm rooms on old campus, or the lax standards of the college masters, uh, something that's, you know, permitting this sort of abysmal uh, state of affairs? And lest you think this was a temporary state of affairs, here's a picture from, um, from two weeks later of the same dorm room. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, the, the books here are noticeably untouched, uh, if you see. Uh, uh, but the, uh, but the uh, suntan lotion has been replaced by a bottle of water. I think these students, the fan has been slightly rotated. Uh, the hat hasn't been moved. I think these students have the wrong priorities as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and it certainly doesn't appear to be doing their laundry. Um, and, but both beds do seem to have been slighted, but barely, uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks. 
And, uh, and, and, and what do you think is going on with these two people? And the one on the left is a very famous sociologist. Who knows what's going on here? Anyone recognize this? Well, the question is, does this crazy attire spread from one person to another? Does one of them, Jeremy Freeze on the left, uh, does one of them dressing uh, in this way uh, make the other one dress in this way? Did they form a union because they both liked a purple? Or was there some kind of exogenous event, like a sporting event uh, at, uh, at Wisconsin, that's making them both uh, act in this ridiculous uh, fashion? Now, the longitudinality of our data that we had in the Framingham Heart Study was very helpful in tracing out the roles of homophily uh, and induction. And so, um, because in this network of human beings, both the prevalence of obesity was changing across time in the last 30 years or so, or 40 years, and the topology of the network, the structure of the ties, was also changing. Now, when James and I began this work, we had the idea that was borrowed from some experiments that many of you probably did in high school physics, Raise your hand if you remember doing that experiment where you set up a water table and an apparatus that will drop pebbles and you can manipulate the height and then it'll create waves and if you do it just right, the waves will hit the perimeter of the box and bounce back and if you're plunking in the things, you'll get standing waves on the surface. Anyone remember this experiment? Some of you, very few of you, AP physics maybe, who knows? Okay, well anyway, that, if you don't remember that experiment, raise your hands if you remember sloshing around in the bathtub when you were a little kid. Okay, do you remember when you move your body like this, if you move it just right in synchrony with the waves, you get a big wave that comes out of the bathtub and makes a big splash on the bathroom floor, that's sort of the same principle, okay? You're making a kind of standing wave in the bathtub uh, and you make a big mess on the bathroom floor. Well, we wondered whether we could see waves of obesity. Could we see in this sociotopological surface, this, this social network, which is an n-dimensional surface, could we see weight gain literally spreading? That is, I gain weight, it makes my friends gain weight. As my friends gain weight, it makes their friends gain weight. Could we visualize this in the network? So I'm about to show you a little 30-second video animation that took five years of my life and a million dollars to make. Uh, and my children used to joke that on a per-second basis, it was more expensive than Avatar and much less interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna, this is real data. Uh, and uh, and <laughs> it took us like, it took us like uh, two years to get the grant funding for this project beginning in 2001 and two years to build the data set and a year to do the statistical analysis and like six months to get this video software to work. And finally in like 2006, James and I are sitting there looking at the video I'm about to show you. And it, this was both the most depressing and the most exciting moment of my scientific career. Okay. <laughs> So every dot's a person. Every line between them is a relationship between two people. The, uh, the purple dots are friendship connections, and the gray dots are, uh, sorry, the purple dots are, uh, the purple lines are spousal connections, and the gray dots are friendship connections. And uh, again, we're going to make dot size proportional to people's body mass index, so bigger dots are bigger people. And we're going to color the dots yellow if people are properly obese. And we're going to take daily cuts through the network, daily cuts for 32 years. Now, we don't weigh everyone every day, but on any given day, roughly every four years when they are weighed, you're going to see the dots get bigger and smaller as people gain weight and lose weight. And people are going to be born and die. People are going to appear and disappear in the network. And you're going to see ties form and break, okay, as people marry and divorce each other or friend and defriend each other. This is the real old-fashioned defriending, not the Facebook defriending. Uh, so they're actually cutting a tie to a person. And when you look at this image, I want you to tell me whether you have any uh, a sense of this wave of obesity. Do you see it or not? So here we go, 1971, 73. You're going to see mostly a sea of yellow, because this is the period of the obesity epidemic in the United States. In a moment, this a person here, the red perimeter dots are women and the blue perimeter dots are men. This person here is going to gain a ton of weight. Here she goes. And she's going to move to the middle of the network, kind of causing obesity around her. This is what we humans do. We make, we make these things. <laughs> did, you, did you see the waves of obesity or not? Raise your hands if you saw the waves. Raise your hands if you didn't see the waves. We were so depressed. <laughs> God, we were depressed. I cannot tell you how depressed we were because we had tried so hard to get this thing to work and for so long, and we were sitting there looking at this video, fully expecting to see these waves, these standing waves, and we didn't see them. 
It took us a whole day before we realized what the flaw in our thinking was. Now, usually in a group of 200, as this is approximately, one person can think of it in like five or 10 minutes. Anyone have any ideas as to why the waves aren't visible? Yeah, what's your name? Joe. Joe, yeah? Okay, that's a good thought. That's a good thought. I'm going to come back to the visual representation of networks later. This uses a certain kind of algorithm for rendering this hyperdimensional object in two-dimensional space. Uh, and it's like taking a photograph of a three-dimensional building. The building is three-dimensional. The photograph is 2D. And depending on where you photograph it from, it might look different. But that's not actually the explanation here. But it's a good thought. Yeah, in the back. The I love DP something. What's your name? Nesh. Nesh? Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah, it's not a, obesity is not a unicentric epidemic, it's a multicentric epidemic. And the proper analogy is not a single hand dropping a single rock on the surface of the pond, but a hand throwing a handful of rocks. So every rock, plunk, 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 is creating these waves, but the waves have wave interference, right? The waves interfere with each other, and they create a choppy surface. Just like if you look out at a, on a still bay, when you see a boat coming in and it leaves a wake, you can see the wake. But if there are many boats coming in and leaving, the wake intersects with each other, and so you get chop on the surface. So we needed other kinds of statistical and mathematical techniques to back out that chop to kind of find evidence for interpersonal influence uh, in, um, in these networks. Now, in addition, looking at this type of uh, image began to kind of change my perspective on human beings, kind of change the way I saw human nature. And I began to see human beings in a completely new way, yet again. Because to my eye, this network moves. Things flow in this network. It changes and evolves. It, it has a memory. It's resilient to injury. It anneals itself. When people die, when they appear disappear, even though the network is like reconfiguring itself, there's something fundamental about its structure that doesn't seem to change. Like there's all this stuff happening as you look at this picture, but it kind of looks the same from moment to moment to moment, enduring across time despite anything that's happening uh, within it. It has, in fact, this coherence and this endurance across time. And so I began to see social networks as living things, as a kind of human superorganism, as, I, as you'll see as, I, as we argue and connect it towards the end of the book. And we used a variety of techniques to study these living networks, to put them under the microscope, and to study all sorts of processes, including social contagion. Now, one of the tricks that we sort of invented and uh, has since been evaluated by others was to exploit the directionality of friendship, to use a basic sociological insight. So let me invite you to reflect on this. Let's say I could say that Sam is my friend. I'm the ego. So in network terms, we're going to call me the ego. It's not because I have a big ego. It's because I'm the ego right now. And, uh, and Sam is the altar. Okay? I'm the ego. He's the altar. Uh, 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 I could say that Sam is my friend, and Sam could reciprocate the nomination, and so there would be a mutual connection between us, okay? Another possibility is that I say Sam is my friend, and Sam doesn't know uh, who the hell I am, okay? <laughs> this was my experience in high school. I thought all these people were my friend, and they had no idea who I was. So, so, uh, so I say Sam is my friend, and he doesn't reciprocate the nomination. That's an ego-nominated friendship. And finally, Sam could say, I am his friend, but I now have no idea who he is. That's an alter-nominated friendship. Everyone understand so far? In which of those three relationships do you think it's most likely that Sam's weight gain would cause my weight gain? Raise your hands. Or speak up. Mutual. Mutual. Yeah, right. We're, we're close buddies. We're tight friends. Sam is doing stuff, I'm paying attention to him, I'm interested in him, he's gaining weight, I'm going to gain weight. Second, which one do you think? Think? Speak up, someone. Who wants to get it? There are only two more options. You've got a 50% chance, even if you knew nothing, of getting it right. Ego nominated or alter nominated? In which case would Sam's weight gain cause my weight gain more? Yeah, what's your name? Yeah. Leah? Leah? Yeah, ego number, exactly. Because I say Sam's my friend. I'm really interested in Sam. I'm paying attention to him. I respect Sam. Sam's gaining weight. I'm copying him. And last, if at all, the alter nominated friendship. Here, Sam is gaining weight. He says, I'm his friend, but I have no idea who the hell he is. I'm not paying any attention to him, right? He's the alter nominated friendship. Now, the reason this is really important is that if it was the McDonald's nearby that was making us both gain weight, the McDonald's doesn't care about the sociological structure of friendship interactions. It doesn't care if I nominate Sam or he nominates me. We should both gain weight at the same time. So if we find a social patterning 
that follows along these lines, it gives us what's known as in econometrics as identification strategy. It gives us a kind of natural experiment, a kind of way of figuring out what's actually happening. And in fact, that's exactly what we found. So this shows the percentage increase in the risk of obesity according to the different kinds of social relationships. So the mutual friend had the biggest effect. So if a mutual friend gains weight, you have almost twice the risk of gaining, becoming obese. An ego perceived friend it went up, I don't know, 57%. And there was no uh, effect of alter perceived friends. We also looked at same-sex friends, and we found that men gain weight when the men to whom they're connected gain weight, and women when the women to whom they're connected gain weight, but no cross cross-sex relationship. So if my female friends gain weight, it doesn't affect me. And if you're a woman and your male friends gain weight, it doesn't affect you. We also looked at spouses and siblings. We looked at the difference between same-sex and opposite-sex siblings and found some gradation. We looked at whether your immediate geographic neighbor affected you and whether your a coworker in the place you work affected you, but only in small uh, workplaces. So this directional data was very important in, because it suggested that confounding by unobserved factors was not a source of the relationship. And we also found that the effect was gendered in the ways that I just suggested, further supporting the social nature uh, of the effect uh, at hand. Now, what might be the actual mechanism uh, of the spread? So there are at least two possible, there are more, but at least two possible sociological mechanisms by which Sam's weight gain can contribute uh, to my weight gain. One is that the alter's appearance or behavior could change the ego's behavior. So here the idea is that Sam says, let's go to Silliman Dining Hall and have muffins and beer. Actually, they don't serve beer at Silliman, but let's say they did. <laughs> so I say, let's say we have muffins and beer, or let's go to Wall Street Pizza or something, have muffins and beer. And I say to Sam, you know, he's my friend, it's a terrible combination, muffins and beer, but you know, I like Sam, so I go and have muffins and beer with Sam. So that's one idea, is that I copy his behavior. Hmm? The second possibility is that it's not Sam's behavior, but rather something about his attitudes or norms. Here, the alter's appearance or behavior changes the ego's expectations or perceptions of norms. So, so Sam gains weight, and it changes my idea about what an acceptable body size is. And then I gain weight, maybe by the same or different mechanism. Maybe he stops his exercise program and gains weight, and then I start eating worse and gain weight. An idea has spread from him to me, but the behavior we evince might be different. Okay? Not the same behavior necessarily. Now, when this paper was published, and we have evidence for both of these in our data. Now, when this paper was published in 2007, headline writers had a field day uh, with this paper. Uh, and in the United States, the, uh, the headline uh, in the New York Times was, Are you packing it on? Blame your friends. But in England, a, a, a newspaper had the following headline, Are your friends gaining weight? Perhaps you are to blame. <laughs> Which is a very telling uh, indictment of the difference between the American and British perspectives on, uh, on, on social life, actually. Um, and I just want to be very, very clear, again, that we do not think of our work as justifying any sort of prejudice. So after our paper was published, James and I got hundreds of thousands of emails, a couple of death threats. Very, a lot of people thought that our work was contributing to the kind of discrimination against people that have bigger bodies, uh, and that this is going to you know, now give additional armor to the people who are uh, you know, uh, against uh, people who are heavy, which is not at all our intention, nor at all, nor did we think it's what our work uh, would support. Uh, but we were just trying to describe uh, the state of affairs. Anyway, once we did this obesity work, we began to think about all kinds of other phenomena to study. We also, for example, looked at smoking, which has been decreasing, not increasing, uh, in the last uh, few decades, as we saw. And as we saw a few lectures ago, the prevalence of smoking has gone from about 45% to 21% in the last four decades, although still about 45 million Americans are smokers, and about half a million deaths, preventable deaths, occur every year. So here's a network map of what's happening. Now we color the dots yellow if they're smokers, otherwise red, and we make the dot size proportional to the number of cigarettes that people smoke per day. Here's the network map in 1971. Here it is 30 years later. Most of the yellow dots are disappearing. People are quitting smoking in droves. Uh, during this time period. And if you zoom in here, you may be able to begin to form an important insight about social networks, which is that there are different positions within the network. For instance, there are positions at the edge of the network and positions in the middle. We'll come back to this idea in a couple of lectures. But if you look here, for instance, if you zoom in here, you might see that the smokers seem to be more likely to be on the edge of the network. They're on the periphery of the network. 
They're not in the center. The two yellow dots are kind of peripherally located within this little region uh, of the graph. Um, and, so, um, and so an analysis similar to those that we did for obesity showed that, again, on average, these clusters of smokers and non-smokers stretched out to three degrees of separation. And once again, we found evidence for interpersonal influence <coughs> in obesity. Now, we got more sophisticated as, uh, as time went by in some of the mathematics we were using to study these uh, networks. And so, and we did the following kinds of analyses. So, the panel on the left shows what is known as the eigenvector centrality. That's a measure of how central you are in the network. Are you in the middle of the network or are you at the edge of the network? There are different mathematical ways of quantifying that. That's shown here on the y-axis. And here on the x-axis is time, measured by the exam number, like every four years in the Framingham Heart Study. And what we found is, is that the non-smokers had roughly the same centrality across time. But as I showed you in that image visually a moment ago, the centrality of the smokers declines across time. Gradually across time, the smokers are pushed to the social margins. The smokers come to occupy different structural locations within the graph. They have a lower eigenvector centrality. Now this eigenvector centrality is the same <coughs> math that underlines, underlies Google's PageRank algorithm. What, what, uh, Page and Brin did is they suddenly realized before them, people just looked at the internet as these nodes and didn't realize that actually each node was connected to other nodes. And you can take advantage of some old math because nodes in the center of the internet are more likely to be the ones you want than nodes on the periphery. And you can quantify this using the eigenvector centrality algorithm. This same math lies at the core of Google search. They serve up to you those pages that are more central rather than more peripheral. Now, of course, it's the algorithm is vastly more complicated than that, but that's the core part of the algorithm. So that's the same math that Google PageRank uses to, to discern who's in the center and who's in the periphery uh, of the network. But in addition, uh, there's something else that's going on which is sort of interesting when you begin to think about this, in addition to this peripheralization uh, argument. Because I told you that smoking prevalence is declining dramatically across this time. So here, uh, but, uh, one thing I didn't tell you is, is that the average cluster size of smokers hasn't changed across time. So, uh, so the, this is the mean smoking cluster size shown, which is flat. Uh, and this is the line that would have been observed if smoking was, uh, was happening uh, at random across the network. So on the one hand, if, if every year, you know, over 30 years, 1% of smokers were quitting, and you looked at the average cluster size of smokers across time, you should find that the cluster size of smokers is declining, as shown in the red line. But that's not what you find. You find a constant rate of smoking, smoker cluster size across time. Does everyone understand the facts as I've summarized them so far? Right? So we have declining prevalence of smokers across time and fixed size of social clusters of smokers. How can that be? Yeah, what's your name? Teddy. Teddy. Because the clusters are changing because smokers aren't really the clusters Okay, so you're saying, what if the smokers are moving their location within the network? Yes, that, that is happening, but if their size of the cluster is staying the same, how can the prevalence be declining? Yeah, in the back, what's your name? Christina. Christina? Uh, there are fewer yes, there are fewer clusters. There are fewer clusters. What's happening is that smokers are quitting in droves. Whole interconnected groups of smokers stop smoking at the same time and drop out of the network. So the cluster size stays fixed while the prevalence declines because interconnected groups of smokers evincing social influence quit simultaneously like a flock of birds changing direction. So the analogy is this. Imagine you're at a wedding reception, and you have 10 tables of 10 people, and you ring a bell every minute, and every minute, 10 people need to leave the room. In one scenario, in the first minute, one person from each table leaves the room, and the cluster size goes from 10 to 9. And in the second minute, another person from each table leaves the room, and the cluster size goes from 9 to 8. And in the third minute, another person from each table leaves, and the cluster size goes from 8 to 7. That's one way one person could, 10 people could leave the room at each minute. An alternative way is you ring the bell and all 10 people from one table get up and leave the room. How many people left at each table on average in the other nine tables? 10. And then the next minute, another 10 people get up. How many people left? Still 10. So the cluster size stays the same as the population declines. 
And it's the difference between groups of people evincing the same behavior in synchrony versus them smattered out across the population uh, behaving uh, in this fashion. Um, so, and then we started to get kind of crazy at this point. This was 2008. Uh, because we decided to start looking at other sorts of things. For example, banana eating uh, in the Framingham Heart Study Network, because we had all kinds of data now, and so we were just rocking and rolling. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so the yellow dots are banana eaters, and the red dots, these are people who eat at least one banana per day. Raise your hands if you're such a person. Okay? So, uh, so yay, banana eaters. And it turns out the banana eaters are forming a little cluster here, living peacefully next to the non-banana eaters, uh, without any evident conflict uh, right here in the middle of, of the network. And we also started to look at other sorts of phenomena. For example, the spread of emotions. Now, when human beings have emotions, such as anger or happiness or fear or disgust, we show them. Why? Why do we show our emotions? Yeah, Leah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you think about this, it's not hard to construct an argument from evolutionary biology as to why it would increase our fitness to experience these emotions. But not only do I experience the emotion, but I show it. And not only do I show it, but you can read it. And not only do you read the emotion, but you copy it. It would seem that emotional contagion was a very deep and fundamental aspect of human emotional experience. And this suggests that what we really need is not just a psychology of human emotions, but a sociology of human emotions. We need to understand the significance of emotions in their social state, not just in their private individual state. And this function of emotions suggests that whatever other advantages they might offer, they are also a primitive form of communication. Now, we're accustomed to thinking about emotional contagion as fleeting and involving just a pair of people. So a few years ago, uh, I presented some of this work in New York City, and I said, you know, like when you're on the subway, and the person across the car from you smiles at you, and you just instinctively smile back. And they said, we don't do that in New York City. <laughs> and I said, well, everywhere else in the world, that's normal human behavior. <laughs> and in fact, if you look at Jane Goodall's work looking at primates, when primates show the, the equivalent to our smile, which is a kind of a play face, other primates copy them and imitate and provide the same play face, signaling, I'm ready for play. I'm not a threat. Um, and of course, emotional contagion can be broader still than in these sort of dyadic social contagion uh, interactions. We can Im imagine punctuated and broad expressions of anger, for instance, in the form of riots, or fear in the form of panics. But we wondered whether emotions might spread beyond pairs of people, and might they do so in a more sustained way than riots? Could there be a kind of a quiet riot? Could there be a kind of below-the-surface emotional stampede rippling below the surface of this social fabric? Maybe emotions spread across network ties well beyond pairs and in a more sustained fashion all the time. In fact, maybe emotions have a collective existence and not just an individual existence. So we made what I think is the first network map of human emotions. Uh, and, and once again, the yellow dots are the happy people and the blue dots are the sad people. We had that in our data using a validated psychometric scale and the green dots are in between. Um, and you can see, once again, clusters of unhappy and happy people within the graph that spread to three degrees of separation. And in addition, if you look at this image, you might be able to see that the unhappy people are more likely to be located on the periphery of the network, and the happy people are more likely to be located in the middle of the network. <laughs> and similar analyses to those that we did earlier document evidence for a kind of emotional contagion uh, or induction. Now, to get around some of the potential problems with drawing conclusions from observational data, so everything I've shown you so far is observational data, and to begin to dig deeper into the evolutionary origin and real function or, or, or deep origin of social networks, we began to do some experiments, opening up a 10-year project uh, that's still ongoing today to look at some fundamental human properties and how they might relate to networks. Now, one of our model systems is this idea of cooperation. Uh, whether people are altruistic or kind to each other or cooperate with each other, or whether they take advantage of each other or so-called defect. And we're going to talk about some experiments today and also next time uh, in this regard. Here's one of the first experiments we published five years ago now. In this experiment, college students who were strangers to each other were brought into the laboratory 
and they were randomly assigned into groups of four people. They didn't know each other. And they were each given a little bit of money, and they were told you could contribute the money to the collective. If you contributed the money to the foursome, the investigator would multiply the money by two. It would be divided amongst the four people equally. So you would pay a price, but the group would benefit. Now, from the point of view of any individual, the best, most rational thing to do is to defect, not contribute, be a free rider, and hope that everyone else contributes. But of course, if everyone does that, the whole thing collapses, and nobody's contributing to the commons. Now, what we were interested in here was something different that had occupied scientists who were concerned with the problem of cooperation before us. So before this, people had been interested in the problem of direct reciprocity. If I'm kind to Sam, does Sam reciprocate the kindness to me? Now, that's a, actually a deep and difficult problem. Why is evolution might favor this type of cooperative behavior? But one explanation is this reciprocity between us, okay? People have spent years studying this problem. Another idea is that if I'm kind to Sam, is Catherine, I don't know where she is today, is Catherine kind to me? So here the idea might be, I'm kind to Sam, Catherine reciprocates the kindness to me, and the reason she does this is either because she thinks she's identified me as a kind, kind of person, there she is, she's a kind, kind of person, so I'm likely to reciprocate it to her, or she thinks of me as a worthy person for her kindness. But what we were interested in is neither of those. We were interested in is if Catherine is kind to me, do I go on to be kind to Sam? Is there a kind of a pay it forward phenomenon that we could find in networks? Could we find evidence for social contagion in altruistic behavior here shown experimentally so we don't have to worry about homophily or context being the sources of this relationship? And in fact, that's exactly what we were able to find. What we found was that if Eleni was kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas was kind to Erica in period two, Erica was kind to Jay in period three, and Jay was kind to Brecken in period four. This is one of the more bizarre results to come out of my lab in the last five years. Because what I've just told you is how Jay treats Brecken depends on how Eleni treats Lucas, even though neither Jay nor Brecken ever interacted with Eleni or Lucas. How you two guys treat each other depends on how those two people treat each other, and you don't even know who they are. <clears throat> a kind of social fabric that ties us all together and that leads to a kind of contagion here in altruistic behavior, here shown experimentally. And actually, this geodesic spread of kindness is different than the temporal persistence of kindness, such that if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas then goes on to be kind to all his subsequent interlocutors in subsequent periods. It turns out if you fold back all the downstream kindness accruing for every extra dollar that Eleni gives Lucas in period one, the network functions as a kind of matching grant, doubling the benefits that accrue to the population. In fact, this is one of our ideas about what the evolutionary origins of human social networks is, is in part to serve as a kind of social magnifying glass, increasing the returns on cooperation, increasing the returns on social learning, which is a very important idea we'll come back to uh, next time. So pay it forward is real. So things spread in networks, and this has been shown uh, for a variety of non-obvious phenomena showed you obesity and smoking behavior today. We and others have done work on drinking and drug use. I showed you some happiness behavior. Uh, this is also the case for loneliness and depression. I just showed you some work on altruism, some experimental work. And it also applies to crime, as I'll show you in a moment. Voting behavior, as I'll show you next time. Uh, tastes uh, and ideas. And most of these things, observationally, seem to spread to about three degrees of separation. But this is just a rule of thumb. Three degrees. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's none. It's just frequently it seems to be to a social horizon of about uh, three degrees of separation. So you probably have all heard about the six degrees of separation idea that between you and anyone else on the planet, there are like at most, on average, six hops, six handshakes to get from you to anyone you want. Well, this, 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 that is a rule that applies to the topology of the network that has to do with the diameter of the global social network, uh, the structure of it. This has to do with the contagion in the network, the kind of extent to which waves decay as they move out, like how far can social influence spread uh, within the graph. And I should emphasize that not everything spreads, and that not everything that spreads spreads by the same uh, mechanism. So germs spread differently than ideas, which spread differently than money, which spread differently than uh, behaviors, which spread differently than emotions. Different things spread different ways. Just because we say spread doesn't mean they all have the same mechanism. And of course, both good and bad things can spread. And in fact, a key idea about networks is in fact that they magnify whatever they are seated with. 
but they must be seated. There has to be a hand dropping rocks. The network on its own doesn't give rise to the phenomenon. The network magnifies an exogenous force. So the argument about obesity is that if we were all isolated individuals without connection to each other, increasing sedentary lifestyles would have made us gain some weight. But the fact that we have in social influence means we gain even more weight. Or if we're, uh, we're, the fact that there is uh, the social interactions between people uh, increases something that applies that would otherwise uh, have applied in any case. So in the cooperation altruism experiment that we did, people are naturally cooperative, but the benefits of that cooperation with that altruism are magnified by the fact that now we have other people we can interact with who can reciprocate that cooperation and create value. So the, inside us is this tendency to cooperation, and the social interactions magnify the benefits of that cooperation. There has to be a hand dropping rocks in order for you to get the waves on the sociotopological uh, surface. Here's some work taken by my colleague Andrew Papakristos here in the sociology department. Andrew's become very interested in crime, uh, and what he's done here is, is he's created a network of 82,000 residents in one Chicago district over five years, and he mapped the co-offending network of 24,000 people who are arrested by the police in the commission of a crime jointly. So if you two guys, if I'm a cop and I arrest you two together, you and your neighbor who's using his iPhone right now, uh, that's you. If I arrest you two for the crime of iPhone usage, uh, then I know you guys are friends, right? Because you were committing this crime together. And then later on, if I arrest you two together, I know you two guys are friends, so maybe you're one degree removed from the other guy over there. So you can use these data to create and map these networks. Um, and in so doing, you could then look at what happens when people were killed in the network. So you could then paint this graph to look at murders within the network. And that's what Andrew did very cleverly. And here she shows the predicted probability of being a homicide victim depending on how far away you are from another homicide victim. So if you're the friend of a homicide victim, your excess risk of dying or your probability of being killed is you know, 80% or something, or 80% increased odds. And it declines in this kind of uh, functional form, the shape inflecting again at around three degrees of separation. So homicide risk is not just distributed in our society according to your race or where you live or your age. It's also distributed according to where you are in the social network. Most of us don't know anyone who's been killed or even have friends of friends who've been killed or friends of friends who've been victims of homicide. So our risk of homicide is very small. But if your friends are getting killed or your friends of friends are getting killed, your risk of homicide goes up, is the argument that Papa Christos uh, is making. And once again, it goes to about three degrees of separation. Well, why three degrees? What might be some explanations for three degrees? And as we discuss in Connected, there are a number of possible explanations for why this observation about three degrees uh, might obtain. One idea is just simple decay. Like the children's game of telephone, right? So you whisper something, and then as the message goes through the system, uh, it decays. Uh, another idea is a kind of, or related is a kind of social friction. So when you throw a rock in a pond or in the ocean, why don't those waves engulf the whole earth? Does anyone know? You throw a, a pebble in the ocean, it creates little waves. Why don't those waves continue all the way across the Atlantic? Who can provide an explanation for that? Anyone? Yeah, I forgot your name. You're Joe. Joe, yeah. Yeah, it gets lost on the way in friction between the water molecules, right? So there's energy in the rock, you throw it onto the pond, it creates the wave. But as the water molecules jostle against each other, the energy gets dissipated in the form of heat. You actually heat the ocean a little bit when you throw the rock in it. Uh, but initially you get this kind of a wave, all right? So the same idea could, appear, could apply in social groups. There could be a kind of social friction, all right? So that as I gain weight it, or give a, send a message to you, it decays with time. That's the first idea for why, at least empirically, it goes out to about three degrees. There's friction, information loss in the system is what explains it. The second idea is what we call the network instability idea. So here the idea is that, okay, raise your hands if you have the same best friend today as you had last year. Okay, raise your hands if you have the same partner or spouse today as you had last year. Okay, raise your hands if you have a different partner or spouse than you had last year. Very few, someone is, you don't have to be shy, it's okay. Uh, raise your, okay, how about this? Raise your hands if you have a different best friend than you had last year. Okay, 
So most of you have the same best friend and the same partner as you had last year, and unless your siblings, you've had the unfortunate experience of having a sibling die, most of you have the same siblings you had last year, 100% of the same siblings. So people's social relationships are relatively static, okay, across time, and we've quantified this. So for you to, uh, but at every step removed from you, there is less and less stability in what we call the electron shell model, right? So who remembers, what's the innermost shell of electrons? For God's sakes, who's taking chemistry? Who's a pre-med? Raise your hands if you're a pre-med, for God's sakes. Okay, which of you is taking chemistry? Thank you. Okay, what is the innermost shell of an electron? S shell, X. All right, what's the next one after S? And then after that? Okay, and what happens at each shell? It gets fuzzier and fuzzier, right? So nearby, the electrons are in tight orbits and you can more predictably predict where they are. And then as you get further and further away, they're more diffuse. Our argument is the same with respect to social networks. The argument is that your friends are stable and relatively constant across time. Your friends, friends less so. Your friends, friends, friends less so. At every degree removed, you get more and more fuzziness. So the argument is you have what we call the network instability idea. So if you want to send a message to your friends, friends, friends at three or four degrees of separation, every node and every tie along that path has to exist across time. But any one of them broken will result in an interruption in the transmission. So the argument is that from day to day, the people that are four degrees removed from you today are not the same people as are four degrees removed from you for tomorrow. So if you send a message there, it never reaches them. They're gone by the time it gets there. You understand this example? Okay. And the, fourth, the third example has to do with what we call the evolutionary argument, which is that we are not hardwired to produce or detect images, uh, signals that are weaker than three degrees because when we evolved, we evolved in networks which there was nobody more than three degrees removed from us. And there was some very nice work that was just published out of the University of Edinburgh in the Ken Lalande group doing some actual experiments showing uh, this exact um, idea. Are there any questions? Yeah, what's your name? Shannon. Shannon. So are these like, degrees of separation consistent across like, age, gender, and all of these We haven't looked, we've looked at whether um, we, in, in our, in our uh, modeling of, for example, smoking cessation effects, we control for those attributes. So we try to get a summary measure of your probability of smoking conditional on my probability of smoking, or your probability of quitting conditional on my probability of quitting after taking into account our age, gender, sex, wealth, education, everything else. And in our smoking paper, we talk a little bit about how, for instance, educated people are more likely to respond to people who quit smoking in their network, and educated people are more likely to have a bigger effect. So if an educated person quits, there's a bigger ripple than if a non-educated person quits. And if an educated person receives the stop smoking signal, he or she is more likely to stop smoking than if an uneducated person receives it. Um, but we've only done that dyadically, so I can't tell you, but I don't think it would be the case that there would be a lot of diff variation in this three degrees thing according to, you know, for example, this, do things spread four degrees in women and two degrees in men? I don't think uh, that's the case. We've done some work looking at whether network structure varies across these master uh, attributes, statuses, you know, gender and race and so forth, and we find very little evidence for that, but, and I'll come back to some of the reasons for that in, uh, in the lecture next time. Did I answer your question, Shannon? Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, what's your name? Joel. Joel. This is um, generally about how you study networks. When you study them, um, so when you plot the three, are those their only relationships or are they essential? Yeah, that's a really good question, and that comes up with networks all the time. So whenever you study networks, you have to specify a boundary condition, right? So you have to say, I'm going to study the networks among Yale students. So I have 5,000 Yaleys. I'm going to see who's who's friends within Yaleys. And I reach you and you say, I have no friends at Yale. And then I say, well, what about back home? Oh, I've got lots of friends back home. And in my church group, I've got tons of friends in my church group. So you would be very central there and have many friends, but here none, for instance. So you might say to me, Nicholas, it's not fair for you to think I'm a social isolate because, in fact, I'm very popular somewhere else. But no matter what, you have to specify a boundary condition because in the limit, you need the whole globe, right? That's the only way you can ever be certain if you have the whole global population that you're not restricting yourself, that's someone in the periphery. And it turns out, in general, people on the periphery of one network will be on the peripheral in most uh, networks. So yes, so we specify a boundary condition. I also want to revisit this issue that I think Joe asked about uh, earlier in terms of describing the network. So um, let me just try to cultivate an intuition in you 
by what we mean when we say topology, because some of you this may be obvious, but others it may not be quite so obvious. So let me hammer that point home. So imagine, imagine that I give you a um, hundred buttons, like from your clothes, okay? And the buttons have little holes in them. And, and you sprinkle the buttons on the floor, and they're this haphazard mess. Everyone with me so far? And now I give you 500 pieces of thread, and I tell you, pick up two buttons at random and connect them with the thread. So you do that. And then take the next piece of thread, two buttons at random, and the next piece of thread, and the next piece of thread, and the next piece of thread, always at random, never excluding previously selected buttons. And you use up all the 500 pieces of thread. Is everyone with me so far in the thought experiment? OK, so now when you look down at this mess, will every button have thread connected to it? No. Some buttons might never have been picked by dumb chance. They've got no connections. Okay? And some buttons will have many threads picked to them, right, in this type of a random network. Okay? So now I look down at this network, and it's this mix of buttons and threads, ties between the nodes. And I pick up one button, and I lift it up off the ground. And when I lift it up, you should have a visual image in your mind that there'll be layers in the buttons. This is the index button. And there'll be buttons that are one thread removed from it. Those are one degree of separation. And then another layer of buttons that are two threads removed from it, and three. These are the geodesic distance, the degrees of separation between this individual and his or her friends. Is everyone with me so far? The maximum height will be the diameter of the network from this individual. Actually, you need to sample all the individuals and get the average diameter. But for now, this is the diameter. Everyone with me so far? OK. Now I'm going to take this mess of buttons, and I'm going to drop it over here. And it's going to fall on the floor. And I'm going to look down at it. You should have the intuition that this pattern of buttons and threads will look different than this pattern of buttons and threads. But you should also have the intuition that there's something fundamental that hasn't changed when I've moved it, right? That thing which hasn't changed is the topology, the architecture of ties, the structure of the network is the same no matter how you render it, right? And the visualization algorithms we use to render these networks try to make visually appearing images of hyperdimensional objects in two-dimensional space. Is that clear? Yeah, Leah. From one to one, right. So what I was blowing by. But this, this shows, when you, when you do this little experiment that I described, the, there's one, two, three, four, five. You might get to seven would be for this node, the furthest reach of the network would be seven degrees. For another node, it might be something else. For one of the nodes, it might be 13, right? Because you pick one peripheral node and it goes all the way to the other. And so to compute the average diameter, you'd have to do that for all of them and then average across it. Blah, blah. Any other questions or ideas? Am I sufficiently enthusiastic about this topic? <laughs> it's my topic. Um, OK, <clears throat> so let me just close today then with uh, an important set of big ideas, which are also discussed in the readings for today. Because to my eye, this perspective on humans and on social systems has a number of significant implications. First of all, we gain insight into how the whole comes to be greater than the sum of its parts. How is it, going back to the Durkheimian question, of suicide and, and this issue of emergence and methodological holism, this basic idea we've been hammering again and again during the class. How is it that the whole comes to be greater than some of its parts? And one of our arguments is that it is the ties between people that make the difference between groups and networks and that give the whole properties that are not present in the parts. The ties add value and they lie at the root of emergence, first. Second, it also means that we can begin to think about new kinds of hierarchy in social systems that many people have previously not paid much attention to. So for example, we are accustomed, you are accustomed to thinking about black and white and rich and poor and urban and rural and old and young and educated and uneducated, and blah, blah, blah. But I'd like to invite you to think about network position. Where are people in networks? Are you in the center or in the edge of the network? Do you have many social contacts or few social contacts? Are you in a clique of bank robbers? Or are you in a clique of Yaleys? You know, what kind of groups do people belong to and in the cliques within uh, the networks, the sort of network uh, communities? So where are people structurally within the network? This gives us a new way of beginning to think about social hierarchy, a different set of axes than the axes we've been considering so far. Third, a network perspective sheds light on the very old and important topic of free will. Now, many people looking at our work have suggested that our work delivers a whack to free will. Because what I've been telling you today is that your, your risk of being a homicide victim, your risk of being obese, your risk of being happy, they depend materially on the risk of other individuals evincing those traits within your network. 
And that would seem to deprive you of individual agency. It would seem to suggest that actually you don't matter so much. What you want doesn't matter so much. The structure, the network structure around you uh, is what's so important. And that's the case, actually. That, does ha that is the case, that our work does subvert the importance of free will. But even as it's doing that, it's also elevating the importance of free will. Because what I've just told you is that if you choose to take a course of action, it can affect your friends, your friends' friends, dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of other people can be affected by choices and uh, decisions that you choose to make in your own life. And fourth, and finally, I think an understanding of networks raises the point about social networks, a very deep point about social networks and goodness. Because one of our arguments is that overall, we form social networks because the benefits of a connected life outweigh the costs. The benefits of a connected life outweigh the costs. And this is a very key idea that we'll come back to next time when we talk about the evolutionary origin of human social networks. Look, if I was always violent towards you, or gave you bad germs, or made you miserably unhappy, or gave you misinformation, you would cut the ties to me and the network would disintegrate. Therefore, the flow of good and desirable properties like altruism and love and happiness and information is required to sustain and nourish the network and keep the ties alive. And similarly, the ties are required for the expression of those desirable properties. You see, I think the spread of good things is required for networks to endure. And in turn, the network is required for good things like love and altruism and happiness and ideas to spread. So I think if we realized how valuable social networks are, and what they are doing for us and what they could do, we'd be the better for it. Because I actually believe that social networks are required for goodness to flourish. That's it for today. Any questions? Yeah. What's your name? Andrew. I can't remember, you know, as I put the slide up, I was suddenly remembering that I didn't know whether it was odds, uh, you know, or whether it was absolute probability. It can't be that you have an 80% chance of dying by homicide if your friends die. So it's got to be an odds, increase in, the, increase in odds. I don't remember. If you look at the paper and clarify, would you email me so I can clean that up for next year? Or I'll, I'll, I should look, but I'm delegating you to look. Let me know. Yes, in the back here. What's your name? Okay. Settle down, everyone. Just one more minute and I'll let you go. Yeah, Daniel. For what? Yes. So remember, uh, one of the ideas that I talked about, so networks will magnify whatever they are seated with. So they'll magnify Ebola. They'll magnify malicious rumors. They'll magnify fascism, right? I think, for example, uh, extreme uh, political ideologies, whether they're on the right or the left, are magnified by these types of social interactions. So I think, yes, they're a predicate. But across evolutionary time, there has to <laughs> As I'll discuss next time, there has to be a kind of balancing of the good and benefit. Otherwise, the net, we wouldn't exist socially. So there's a benefit to the social existence, and it turns out to this particular set of network interactions. All right, see you next time.